And now we have some further thoughts on those two most popular of pets, cats and dogs. What I've suffered from this morning, no tongue can tell. It began with Gustavus Adolphus. Gustavus Adolphus, Gusty for short, is a very good sort of dog. When he's in the middle of a large field or on a fairly extensive common, but I won't have him indoors. He means well, but this house is not his size. He stretches himself, and overgo two chairs and a whatnot. He wags his tail, and the room looks as if a devastating army had marched through it. He breathes, and it puts the fire out. At dinner time, he creeps in under the table, lies there for a while, and then gets up suddenly. The first intimation we have of his movements being given by the table, which appears animated by a desire to turn somersaults, we all clutch at it frantically, and endeavour to maintain it in a horizontal position. Whereupon his struggles, he being under the impression that some wicked conspiracy is being hatched against him, become fearful. And the final picture presented is generally that of an overturned table and a smashed-up dinner, sandwiched between two sprawling layers of infuriated men and women. He came in this morning in his usual style, which he appears to have founded on that of an American cyclone, and the first thing he did was to sweep my coffee cup off the table with his tail, sending the contents full into the middle of my waistcoat. I rose from my chair hurriedly and approached him at a rapid rate. He preceded me in the direction of the door. At the door, he met Eliza coming in with eggs. Eliza observed, "Ugh." And sat down on the floor. The eggs took up different positions about the carpet, where they spread themselves out. And Gustavus Adolphus left the room. I called after him, strongly advising him to go straight downstairs and not let me see him again for the next hour or so. And he, seeming to agree with me, dodged the coal scoop and went. While I returned, dried myself, and finished breakfast. I was sure he'd gone into the yard. But when I looked into the passage ten minutes later, he was sitting at the top of the stairs. I ordered him down at once, but he only barked and jumped about. So I went to see what was the matter. It was Titums. She was sitting on the top stair but one, and wouldn't let him pass. Titums is our kitten. She's about the size of a penny roll. Her back was up, and she was swearing like a medical student. She does swear fearfully. I do a little that way myself sometimes, but I'm a mere amateur compared with her. To tell you the truth, I think it does a man good to swear. Swearing has the same soothing effect upon our angry passions that smashing the furniture is so well known to exercise. Added to which, it's much cheaper. I rather distrust a man who never swears, or savagely kicks the footstool, or pokes the fire with unnecessary violence. Without some outlet, the anger caused by the ever-occurring troubles of life is apt to rankle and fester within. Swearing relieves the feelings. I explained this to my aunt on one occasion, and she said I had no business to have such feelings. That is what I told Titums. I told her she ought to be ashamed of herself, brought up in a Christian family as she was too. I don't so much mind hearing an old cat swear. But I can't bear to see a mere kitten give way to it. I put Titums in my pocket and returned to my desk. I forgot her for the moment, and when I looked, I found that she'd squirmed out of my pocket onto the table, and was trying to swallow the pen. Then she put her leg into the ink pot and upset it. Then she licked her leg, and then she swore again at me this time. I put her down on the floor, and there Tim began rowing with her. I do wish Tim would mind his own business. It was no concern of his what she'd been doing. Besides, he's not a saint himself. He's only a two-year-old fox terrier, and he interferes with everything and gives himself the airs of a grey-headed Scotch collie. Titums's mother has come in, and Tim has got his nose scratched, for which I'm remarkably glad. I've put them all three out in the passage where they are fighting at the present moment. I'm in a mess with the ink. And in a thundering bad temper, and if anything more in the cat or dog line comes fooling about me this morning, it had better bring its own funeral contractor with it. Yet, in general, 
I like cats and dogs very much indeed. What jolly chaps they are. They're much superior to human beings as companions. They do not quarrel or argue with you. They never talk about themselves, but listen to you while you talk about yourself and keep up an appearance of being interested in the conversation. They never make stupid remarks. They never say unkind things. They never tell us of our faults merely for our own good. They do not, at inconvenient moments, mildly remind us of our past follies and mistakes. They do not say, oh yes, a lot of use you are, sarcastic-like. They never inform us, like our inamoratas sometimes do, that we're not nearly so nice as we used to be. We're always the same to them. They're always glad to see us. They are with us in all our humours. They are merry when we're glad, sober when we feel solemn, sad when we are sorrowful. When we bury our face in our hands and wish we'd never been born, they don't observe that we've brought it all upon ourselves. They don't even hope it'll be a warning to us. But they come up softly and shove their heads against us. If it is a cat, she stands on your shoulder, rumples your hair and says, Lor, I am sorry for you, old man, as plain as words can speak. And if it's a dog, he looks up at you with his big, true eyes and says with them, Well, you've always got me, you know. We'll always stand by each other, won't we? He's very imprudent, a dog is. He never makes it his business to inquire whether you're in the right or in the wrong. Never bothers as to whether you're going up or down upon life's ladder. Never asks whether you're rich or poor. You're his pal. That's enough for him. And come luck or misfortune, he's going to stick to you, to comfort you, guard you, give his life for you, if need be. Foolish, brainless, soulless dog. Cats have the credit of being more worldly wise than dogs, of looking more after their own interests, and being less blindly devoted to those of their friends. Cats certainly do love a family that has a carpet in the kitchen more than a family that has not, and if there are many children about, they prefer to spend their leisure time next door. But taken altogether, cats are libelled. Make a friend of one, and she will stick to you through thick and thin. All the cats that I've had have been most firm comrades. I had a cat once that used to follow me about everywhere, until it even got quite embarrassing, and I had to beg her, as a personal favour, not to accompany me any further down the high street. She used to sit up for me when I was late home, and meet me in the passage. It made me feel quite like a married man, except that she never asked where I'd been, and then didn't believe me when I told her. I wish people could love animals without getting maudlin over them, as so many do. Women are the most hardened offenders in such respect. There are the gushing young ladies who, having read David Copperfield, have thereupon sought out a small, long-haired dog of nondescript breed, and they kiss its nose and put its unwashed head up against their cheek in a most touching manner, though I've noticed that these caresses are principally performed when there are young men hanging about. Then there are the old ladies who worship a fat poodle, scant of breath and full of fleas. I knew a couple of elderly spinsters once who had a sort of German sausage on legs, which they called a dog. They used to wash its face with warm water every morning. It had a mutton cutlet regularly for breakfast, and on Sundays, when one of the ladies went to church, the other always stopped at home to keep the dog company. There are many families where the whole interest of life is centred upon the dog. Cats, by the way, rarely suffer from excess of adulation. A cat possesses a very fair sense of the ridiculous, and will put her paw down kindly but firmly upon any nonsense of this kind. Dogs, however, seem to like it. They encourage their owners in the tomfoolery. The consequence is that in the circles I am speaking of, what dear Fido has done, does do, will do, won't do, can do, can't do, was doing, is doing, is going to do, shall do, shan't do, and is about to be going to have done, is the continual theme of discussion from morning till night. All the conversation, consisting as it does of the very dregs of imbecility, is addressed to this confounded animal. The family sit in a row all day long, watching him, commenting upon his actions, telling each other anecdotes about him, vying with each other in bursts of admiration for the brute, until some more than usually enthusiastic member, unable any longer to control his feelings, swoops down upon the unhappy quadruped in a frenzy of affection, 
clutches it to his heart and slobbers over it. Whereupon the others, mad with envy, rise up and, seizing as much of the dog as the greed of the first one has left to them, murmur praise and devotion. Among these people, everything is done through the dog. If you want to make love to the eldest daughter, or get the old man to lend you the garden roller, you have to begin with the dog. You must gain its approbation before they will even listen to you. And if, as is highly probable, the animal, whose frank, doggy nature has been warped by the unnatural treatment he has received, responds to your overtures of friendship by viciously snapping at you, your cause is lost forever. If Fido won't take to anyone, the father has thoughtfully remarked beforehand, I say that man is not to be trusted. He knows, bless him. Drat him. And to think that the surly brute was once an innocent puppy, all legs and head, full of fun and play, and burning with ambition to become a big, good dog and bark like mother. Ah, me, life sadly changes us all. The world seems a vast, horrible, grinding machine, into which what is fresh and bright and pure is pushed at one end to come out old and crabbed and wrinkled at the other. Look even at Pussy Sobersides, with her dull, sleepy glance, her grave, slow walk, and dignified, prudish airs. Who could ever think that once she was the blue-eyed, whirling, scampering, head-over-heels, mad little firework that we call a kitten? What marvellous vitality a kitten has! It is really something very beautiful, the way life bubbles over in the little creature's they rush about and mew and spring, dance on their hind legs, embrace everything with their front ones, roll over and over and over, lie on their backs and kick. They don't know what to do with themselves, they're so full of life. Can you remember when you and I felt something of the same sort of thing? Can you remember those glorious days of fresh young manhood? How, when coming home along the moonlit road, we felt too full of life for sober walking, and had to spring and skip and wave our arms and shout, till belated farmers' wives thought, and with good reason too, that we were mad and kept close to the hedge while we stood and laughed aloud to see them scuttle off so fast, and made their blood run cold with a wild parting whoop, and the tears came we knew not why. Oh, that magnificent young life that crowned us kings of the earth, that rushed through every vein till we seemed to walk on air, that thrilled through our brains and told us to go forth and conquer the whole world, that welled up in our young hearts till we longed to stretch out our arms and gather all the toiling men and women and the little children to our breast and love them all, all. Yes, they were grand days, those deep, full days when our coming life like an unseen organ, pealed strange, yearnful music in our ears, and our young blood cried out like a warhorse for the battle. Our pulse beats slow and steady now, and our old joints are rheumatic, and we love our easy chair and pipe and sneer at boy's enthusiasm. But oh, for one brief moment of that godlike life again!